All right, man. Welcome to Crow Triple Seven Radio. This is the introduction for episode 86. Jason Lingren is with me, and we will be covering Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and Alistair Crowley. Um, it's an interesting episode. When when I began to go through Blavatsky's work, it became, you know, the, the conclusions I'm going to draw here became apparent pretty quickly. Um, I reread two books that I had gone through some time ago. Uh, one of them is Isis Unveiled, which, uh, spoiler, uh, Isis is not unveiled in that book. And uh, the other one is The Secret Doctrine. I forget which is attributed to being her first book. Um, I went through these things very carefully, and uh, knowing what I know about other things we've researched and things that I have researched since I was been in my 20s, a lot of it doesn't hold water. But as we get in, we'll begin to cite the problems with Blavatsky and the idea of Blavatsky. Well, I can't tell you if there ever was an actual person named Blavatsky in the same way I can't really tell you if there was an actual person named Crowley, although I think it's more likely there was in his case. Um, we can, in fact, go at the writings that we have. Now, Crowley, he's much more interesting. We cover him in the second hour, and, you know, everyone's aware of the influence of Crowley. He's been in so much pop culture, so much music. Uh, even in some of the 9-11 breakdowns we've done, uh, you can see the influence of Crowley. Even people around surrounding that incident, having the name Crowley, um, although I've forgotten exactly who it was. It's been so long since I did that uh, research and episode. Um, now, Crowley, I once again went at his writings. And uh, the last thing that I looked at was the 777 Kabbalistic writings, incidentally, which has no influence over the naming of my channel. There is no connection there, absolutely, emphatically. Um, but I couldn't get through it again. This is the second time I've went at that tome, and it is so dry and so nonsensical as to be a hard slog to get through any of it. And even in the prefaces to some of these writings, they will tell you flat out um, you won't understand what's going on here. And as you develop as a student, in their words, you'll even understand less. Then it goes on to say sorcerers have their own language and they don't even know half the time what they are saying, what the meaning of what they are saying is. But to top it off, so much of that particular book attributed to Crowley uh, is tied directly to the Hebrew language and the Hebrew characters. And actually, I don't even know if that's true because I suppose it could be Yiddish. I know there's a distinction there. Hebrew being spoken by, I don't know, roughly 9 or 10 million people in the world, I think, and Yiddish being attached to the Ashkenazi Jews. My point here is this. Um, if you don't speak those languages, how the heck are you going to make heads or tails out of all these tables and charts and mystical symbols and all these things that were attached uh, in the 777 work by Crowley? And not only that, as you get into the backstory, there are plenty of scholars who did speak the language who said Crowley was not proficient. So I would ask, um, this man's at attaching, uh, what are there, 22 characters I've forgotten now, whatever the, the number of characters from, I think it's Hebrew, into these charts. And we're being told uh, by people who grew up speaking the language and scholars that Crowley was not proficient. All kinds of things we're going to cover here. Anyhow, uh, let's jump in with Jason Lingren for episode 86. It's very interesting. In the second hour, there's a lot there. Um, Crowley has just, I mean, he's been everywhere. Both these people are a bit like Indiana Jones. Almost unbelievable how many things these people did in their lives. Anyhow, let's jump in. All right, man. Welcome to Crow 777 Radio Podcast. This is episode 86. Jason Lingren is with me, and we're going to be covering Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and Edward Alistair Crowley. Mr. Crowley. Anyhow, welcome, Jason. Hello. Are we ready to do some magical things? <laughs> we can try. We can try. Anyhow, there's a couple things we need to cover before we get in. Um, there's announcements all over the place how censorship is going to be dealt with with artificial intelligence, all kinds of places, social media and otherwise, announcing uh, they're going to unleash AI into the wild to do their censorship, and they're using things like pedophilia, terror, fear, violence, these types of things to lead the way to their censorship. Um, but I would also mention uh, the same week that you and I did our AI episode, uh, Sky and Telescope magazine came to my mailbox, and even there, they're announcing 
the growing use of AI and astronomy. Um, it's astonishing, you know, how quickly all of a sudden one day no one's heard of AI and the next day it's everywhere, man. What do you think? Yeah, now all of a sudden it's the big thing everywhere. It's, it's almost like uh, the flavor of the day, maybe you could say. Yeah, but it, it you know, it, what it really goes to show is how long AI has actually been at it. You know, they're just talking about it openly now, but these things don't form overnight. Uh, I mean, I started to do some research on the tail of our last thing, and AI goes way the heck back, even before supposed computers, the idea of AI is coming to bear. But uh, let's announce again that transcripts for episodes, many of the episodes, I think the the latest maybe 25 or 30 episodes, the transcripts are up on crow777radio.com. You have to be a member and logged in to see that link and, and have access to those. Uh, what else do we have? Well, we're going to very quickly work our way back through all the episodes. So I know some folks were asking for previous episodes that were a little older and, and, we're, and we're getting there. The person transcribing them is slowly but surely getting through them all, and I don't think it's going to take that long. Well, you, yeah, everyone should realize there's actually a human being here listening back to the episodes and transcribing them by hand. They are nearly word perfect uh, to what, what we covered. Anyhow, before we jump in, I will also mention that I was just on Jeff Rentz's radio network. I did a show with Jeff Rentz. Uh, he was one of the people who invited me on when I put out the call to go on platforms and talk about censorship. And I would also like to promote a YouTube channel out there that I think is a big damn deal. Uh, the channel is Rob S. First name is R-O-B. Last name, it's actually not his name, but the last name is E-S-S. -S. Rob S. Uh, he's in Scotland. This man, this living man, is standing up against uh, basically kangaroo courts, breaking every rule in the book and trying to stand up for the common law rights of living men and women. And he was jailed recently and actually a court order, or I guess as they were calling it, an administrative hearing because they don't know what to do with people who actually know their rights, um, banned him from using YouTube. He had to have a friend post videos to give updates. Uh, the man gets out of jail and he doesn't even say a peep about his own imprisonment and starts defending people's children being wrongly taken away from them and these other types of things. Anyhow, pop over to Rob S. channel, subscribe, give the man the thumbs up. You're looking at truly a living man, and that damn well means something uh, in this day and age. Anyhow, Jason, anything else before we jump in? Yeah, I just want to address the fact that some of the things we do have obviously been done on other programs and all that, but th there's two reasons why we will cover topics. One, this is a different audience and may not be familiar with a particular topic, and two, you're getting our particular take on subject matters that we may have looked into on our own for years, and you and I obviously have slightly different points of view, and we crunch data in different ways in our minds, and we come together as a meeting of the minds, to give our opinion and take on things. So it's just something I want to throw out there in case people are wondering, oh, well, AI has been being talked about for, for ages now. It's like, of course, we haven't done it yet, and we just wanted to discuss it ourselves. And we have a lot of listeners here. They, they may not be that familiar with it, and, and they happen to like the particular flavor that we put out here. So that's what I am really want to get out there about all this. Right. And the other thing about the way we do our shows, Jason, is we challenge. Um, we do the research and we challenge the information, trying to force it to mean something, trying to validate itself or prove itself that it can't be validated, which is going to come up time and time again in this episode with Blavatsky and Crowley. And just to make it perfectly clear, um, I read, well, as much as I could, and for the second or third time uh, I've gone at this, I haven't gotten all the way through it, Crowley's Triple Seven, the Kabbalist, Kabbalist Ballistic writings. Uh, I read from Blavatsky, Isis Unveiled, and The Secret Doctrine, I think is the name of the other one. One of those two is her first book, supposedly. Um, and I don't know, I think Jason and I pretty much see eye to eye on Blavatsky. I'm not sure where he's going to come down on Crowley. Um, but I'm not going to mince words. Uh, I find problems. I find problems all the way through both of these people. But anyhow, Jason, without any further ado, shall we jump in? Let's. First thing I want to bring up is the definition of something called spiritualism. And this was very big in the late 1800s into the 1920s-ish, and then it kind of branched off and did its own thing. But it is the belief that the spirits of the dead have both the ability and the desire to communicate with the living. The afterlife, or the spirit world, 
as seen by those who practiced and still do practice in some cases, spiritualism as a place of existence in which spirits continue to exist as well as continue to change and evolve. Two beliefs that contact with spirits is possible and that spirits are more advanced than humans led spiritualists to a third belief that spirits are capable of providing useful knowledge about moral and ethical issues as well as about the nature of God and the universe. Some spiritualists will also speak of entities that they refer to as spirit guides, who would be specific spiritual beings contacted repeatedly, who would be relied upon for spiritual advice and guidance. Spiritism, a branch of spiritualism developed by Alan Kardec and today practiced mostly in continental Europe and Latin America, especially in Brazil, emphasizes the concept of reincarnation. Spiritualism developed and reached its peak growth in membership from the 1840s to the 1920s, especially in English-speaking countries. By 1897, spiritualism was said to have more than 8 million followers in the United States and Europe, mostly coming from the middle and upper classes. Spiritualism flourished for half of a century without canonical texts or formal organizations of any sort, but instead attained a loose form of cohesion through periodicals, tours by trans lecturers, camp meetings, and the missionary activities of accomplished mediums. Many prominent spiritualists were women, and like most spiritualists, supported more humanitarian ideals of the times, such as the abolition of slavery and women's suffrage. By the late 1880s, the credibility of the informal movement had weakened due to accusations of fraud being perpetrated by mediums, and formal spiritualist organizations began to appear. Spiritualism is currently practiced primarily through various denominational spiritualist churches in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. This could, depending upon how you look at it, cross over into certain Christian sects as well, specifically ones who practice the notion of the Holy Spirit overtaking a person, with said individual performing certain acts such as jumping around, thrashing about, running, and speaking in tongues. The first Christian sect that pops into my mind are the Pentecostals, although there are others. Right. So this is probably going to play into the whole Blavatsky idea, right, Jason, because of the time, you know, it's near 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 the end of her time of popularity. I'm assuming that's why uh, you covered this. Correct. She kind of spearheaded a lot of the more popular notions of this, and there are plenty of others as well. But like a lot of them, she got accused of fraud at, at uh, certain points in her life. Well, in Blavatsky's case, I think there's good reason, and we're going to cover these things. There are endless problems with what Blavatsky said of her own self, and endless problems about where she actually may or may not have gone in the world. Um, these problems uh, recur through the entire timeline, and I noticed that you're going to cover some of them, so uh, I'll just hold off. Let's keep pushing. Right. So, although various spiritualist traditions have their own beliefs known as principles, there are some shared concepts a belief that the soul continues to exist after the death of the physical body, a belief in spirit communication, even after death it is possible for the soul to learn and improve, a belief in a god, often referred to as infinite intelligence, the natural world is considered to be an expression of god infinite intelligence and personal responsibility for life circumstances. And again, this sort of crisscrosses over into other mainstream religions such as parts of Christianity. And this can tie into Blavatsky and with Crawley because... Crawley's magical systems also deal with spirits and all that sort of thing. Right. Both of these people are going to rely heavily at times on Buddhism. Um, and so the idea of reincarnation or that some portion, probably in the Buddhist tradition, the mind goes on after death. Um, so, you know, we're, I'm going to point out problems with Blavatsky and her take or her supposed interaction with Buddhist masters who supposedly trained her up. Um, real problems with all of that, but then I know enough about Buddhism and had studied Eastern religions and Tibetan Buddhism specifically to find flat out that some of the claims she, she makes are erroneous. Not only erroneous, um, that they don't match what the Tibetan systems actually teach, but in as much as she's got these doctrines written down that she claims, you can go into any Go, I think it's Galupa is the word, which is the sect the Dalai Lama belongs to, the Yellow Hats. I don't know if I said that right. She said you can go into any monastery of this sect and find these doctrines written down. Well, as fact would have it, many people tried to do this and could never find the claims or the things written that Blavatsky said were so readily available. So there's that, Jason. A few more definitions and background bits before we get into the people themselves. Theosophy. 
any of a number of philosophies maintaining that a knowledge of God may be achieved through spiritual ecstasy, direct intuition, or special individual relations, especially the movement founded in 1875 as the Theosophical Society by Helena Blavatsky and Henry Steele Olcott. So as I was going through, I found that apparently Henry Steele Olcott gets to be at odds at some point with Blavatsky. Did you cover any of that? Uh, just a little bit. She had a lot of problems with people, and later on especially, she would get accused of, again, fraud from ex-members and all that. So who knows what was really going on? It could have been a power play because obviously money started getting involved with these big societies and all that. So you really don't know what was actually going on behind the scenes. It would be interesting to know how much money was changing hands in all this um, because so much of Blavatsky's story just doesn't hold water um, at all. Uh, but anyhow, go ahead. Keep pushing. All right, the next point is on Thalema. It is a spiritual and social philosophy developed in the early 1900s, calling each person to act in alignment with his or her true will, which may or may not be the same as personal wishes, as a basis for spiritual growth. And this is Aleister Crawley's branch of spiritual matters. Right, so it's, you know, uh, what, what's the saying, uh, do what thou wilt or something to that effect. Um, it's being echoed here. Just as a lot of subjects we have covered, I'm going to be skipping a whole lot. With Blavatsky and with Crawley, these people did things. My big joke is they're like Indiana Jones. They've done so much crap. There's just no way. George Lucas should have been making movies about these people, not with Harrison Ford. It's just the <laughs> amount of crap that these people supposedly did in a time period when travel was difficult, unsafe, and took a hell of a long time. It just seems very unlikely that a lot of the things these people claim they did, they actually did. Here, here. Yes. A lot of stories revolve around Helena Blavatsky, but one of the huge problems, if indeed she was a real living person, as mainstream history states, is that she told different stories and different versions of those stories to different people at different times. This makes it very, very difficult to nailing a lot of the specifics of her life down whatsoever. The people who are her fans, and some of them are very diehard fans, who oftentimes treat her with a rock star-like status and reverence, with, of course, appropriate mythos to accompany, they seem to pick and choose what to believe about her as they individually deem fit, because there's a good bit of information out there about her, but not a whole lot that can be proven effectively to any degree. Especially if she was a real person in spinning yarns, you just don't even know in the first place. Well, I think to some degree we can address this. You know, all the claims that she's going into places to meet high llamas that take her in and train her up and all this kind of stuff. There is easily as much verbiage of people trying to prove she went to any of these places as there is people stating flat out she never went to any of these places. She was in Europe the whole time. Um, but I will point out in the two books that I had read previously and then went through again for this episode, uh, they're both abridged versions, uh, Isis Unveiled and The Secret Doctrine. And as you read why it was abridged, you start to get another tale where there are, uh, if you read between the lines, it's almost like they're taking out all this nonsensical, erroneous material and trying to boil it down to something people can get behind. That's the way I feel about it. And I know others will have a different point of view, but to the point where there's even so much done where they're comparing Buddhism to Christianity and all these other religious traditions – and she's making erroneous claims, like that in a Buddhist tradition, there was at one point in our, you know, dim, dim past, a nothing, a time when there was nothing. Well, that's not the Buddhist belief at all. The Buddhist belief logically breaks down and comes to this conclusion, that you can't make a life out of nothing. So that means we've been here all along, that we've always been here in that kind of point of view. People are, you know, reincarnated over and over and over and over. And in some certain sects of Buddhism, that life could be not a person, any other kind of life in some sects. Other ones kind of stick more to once you're a person, you're, you know, always going to be a reincarnated person. But these glaring, glaring problems are at almost every turn for a person who's going to challenge the information. Anyhow, back to you. Well, in Buddhism, isn't it an enclosed circular system? 
Well, yeah, it's illustrated that way in things like the Wheel of Life, which, if I remember correctly, a king asked the Buddha to explain uh, the Buddhist philosophy, and he made the, the Wheel of Life image to illustrate to the king. And in that, you know, at the center of the wheel, you have the three poisons, which is uh, said to be what keeps everyone stuck in samsara, samsara being the cycle of living and dying and being reincarnated uh, in that kind of illustration. It shows, I don't know, six or eight realms uh, that living beings can be born into, where we live now is one of them, animals one of them, there are versions of hell, and then there are maybe what you might call versions of heaven for the Western mind, but it's more like godlike beings, but not not gods. They're all going to die uh, in that construct. So uh, I think you're referring to the Wheel of Life uh, illustration that's been put forward so often in almost every sect of Buddhism. All right, so, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. She was born into an aristocratic family. Her birth name is Helena Petrovna von Hahn in the Ukrainian town of Yekaterinoslav, excuse me for that, which was then part of the Russian Empire. Her birth date was August 12, 1831, but according to the Julian calendar that was used in 19th century Russia at the time, it was July 31st. Immediately after her birth, she was baptized into the Russian Orthodox Church. So one of the things about Blavatsky uh, in the writings, in the books, it says over and over that she was never schooled uh, to any great degree and that she was self-taught and all these things. And this is where I start to have logical problems uh, with even her backstory. She's aristocratic family. I suppose you could make the argument that maybe women were not going to university or doing other things uh, at the same rate as men, but you're going to have a hard time convincing me that anyone from an aristocratic family back in these days was not being educated at a level far superior to the people in the, in the surrounding countryside. As an example, very few aristocratic families um, didn't have members that spoke three, four, five languages. That was part of it. You know, if you're going to be an aristocrat, you needed to know English, you needed to know French. Um, as examples, many of these people who are going to be part of the church would also know Latin. And then, of course, of course, if you were an aristocratic family, uh, you had to know Greek because all of the classics were written in Greek. Um, so this is even from the very get-go, uh, though I guess you can't prove it out one way or another. I find logical problems in what we're being told. She she did get some schooling from what I read about, but it wasn't uh, a formal schooling. It was more, you can call it homeschooling, I guess, but it was still a very higher education type of thing. See, in the, in the accounts that I read, I think, is it the secret doctrine um, in the preface, the person who abridged, both, actually the same person abridged both those those writings, uh, is cl it makes a big point to say she never had formal education, um, and it doesn't go much beyond that in the two things that I read. So much inconsistencies from the beginning here. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, from my point of view, any, any aristocratic birth in this period of time is going to be well-educated above the surrounding kind of lower caste of society. She is said to have been an unusual child with plenty of references to the superstitions and beliefs of her time making its way into the descriptions of her childhood. She is said to have surrounded herself with mystery as a child, for example, making claims to her childhood friends that in the subterranean corridors of their old house at Saratov that she would explore that she was never actually alone but would have companions and playmates whom she called her hunchbacks. She is definitely described as a storyteller as a child. Well, there it is. Um, this is going to come up over and again, and unfortunately for her, or for her biography, half the stories she tells don't jive. And again, you know, there's glaring problems, like supposedly I went to Tibet or these other places where I was trained up by these yogis and other masters. Um, and that seems like it would be an easy thing to prove, Jason. If, if you truly went to these places, why is it so difficult for anyone to demonstrate that it happened? Uh, for me, logic and the ring of truth are not in any of it. And so describing her as a storyteller as a child, I think it fits the narrative. As do I. Her mother died young at the age of 28 in 1842. She is said to have done some traveling with her father throughout Europe. And at the age of 17 in 1849, she married a 40-odd-year-old general named Nesifor Blavatsky. She shortly thereafter ran off to her grandfather. And right after that is when she is said to have begun her Indiana Jones-like world traveling adventures. 
There you go. So here, here we go. Start to see the narrative. Uh, she's marrying a general. Um, she's an elite bloodline herself. And so I'll ask the question, um, knowing what we know of the classes, particularly back from in the 1800s, what do we know of how the upper echelons of society treat everyone else, the masses? Um, it's an us and them game, isn't it? They're vying for control. Uh, they're getting more education. They're educating and marrying into important places, in this case, a general. So I would ask, you know, really, uh, is this a person who's going to go out and learn all these spiritual secret secrets and then just publish them for the masses in general? And again, this is another part of the story I kept coming back to where everything about her backstory makes her an elite family bloodline, even in so much as she's marrying a damn general, um, that these, these mean things. And it's a class system. So it's just more logical holes I can poke in what we're about to be told. Much of what is known about her between 1849 and her arrival in New York in 1873 is really only known by what she told other people. The problem was, as we've initially pointed out, she supplied various people with a wide selection of biographies. She told so many different stories that covered so many years that all the events taken together could not have occurred to a single person in a single lifetime. So let's just say what we're both thinking, charlatan. Um, that's what I'm thinking. And I'll point out another thing. Like if you get, I think it's the secret doctrine. There's so many pictures of Blavatsky, a lot of them very similar. She's almost always touching her face or her temple. Um, but notice her left eye uh, in many of the images where it just seems a little funny, a little constructed. Um, I can't tell you if this person lived, but I can pretty confidently come down on what we've been told and the writings we've been handed uh, don't merit any serious value to any degree. Uh, it seems constructed. It seems almost like when you hear the snake salesman's claims made around the spiritualism of the time that uh, Helena Blavatsky could have fit right into that category. That's my take. She is said to have eventually returned to her husband on the condition that she wouldn't be required to see him too much. In her later years, her ever-changing storytelling continued in regards to the details of this marriage in that she kept making herself younger and her husband older. By the time she got through, she was portraying him as a lecher of around 80, forcing his attentions on a little girl. At some point, this marriage seemed to have some sort of an official end, for she had a second marriage that also ended in failure sometime around 1874. Did she ever get to the bottom? Of, I mean, so it, it was never clear to me. So she's off to New York as the husband. You know, he's a general. He must be back in Russia, right? Is that is that how this came out? Yeah. Details were scant, and uh, I really just didn't care that much about her personal life anyway. It was more the point that authors were making very strong fact of the storytelling again. So this is it. This is what she does. Well, it makes you wonder. So her whole lifetime that we read about is somewhere else. And yet supposedly there's this general, this husband who's a general somewhere back in uh, in Russia. It's just I, I don't know. None of it flows well, Jason, and none of it logically holds up. And as you're pointing out here, she's making up stories about the supposed marriage that don't seem to fit the actual chronology of how old people would be in this type of thing. Again, I'm just going to say it, man. Charlatan. Well, a younger girl with an older man is not unheard of, especially in these times. It's the fact that she kept changing the narrative later on, and, it, and apparently a lot of people knew this and kept pointing it out. Right. I just don't know what the point of it would be. She's on She's on a different continent, you know. What does it even matter? Why would you even be addressing it? Um, clearly, you're separated. And the idea that you'd stay married if you didn't see him very often, um, there's really nothing that I saw in any of the writings claiming she's leaving Europe or leaving America to go back to Russia to visit a husband. Uh, none of that. Trying to make herself look better, I assume. She's not with the man because this is, of course, the, the Victorian era. So the woman was a secondary citizen. My guess would be she's trying to make herself look like a victim and trying to get away from this horrible person. Right. And so if, in fact, she is a real person and if, in fact, she was from an elite bloodline, uh, we can imagine that a marriage like this would be arranged anyhow, um, you know, upper class to upper class. So I guess that that possibility does exist. Her first stop in her amazing journeys beginning in 1849 was Constantinople. Here, she claimed to have developed a friendship with a Hungarian opera singer named Agardi Mitrovich, whom she first encountered when saving him from being murdered. Also there, she met the Countess Sofia Kiseljova, who she would accompany on a tour of Egypt, Greece, and Eastern Europe. 
In Cairo, she met the American art student Albert Rawson, who later wrote extensively about the Middle East, and together they allegedly visited a Coptic magician, Paulos Medamon. In 1851, she journeyed to Paris, where she encountered the mesmerist Victor Michal, who is said to have impressed her. From there, it was on to England, and would claim that it was here that she met the mysterious Indian who had appeared in childhood visions, a Hindu, whom she referred to as the Master Moria. She provided various conflicting accounts of how they met, locating it in both London and Ramsgate according to separate stories. She always maintained that he claimed that he had a special mission for her and that she must travel to Tibet. <laughs> so can we get a male rooster and a poppy together here so I could just say poppycock? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, she needs her Indiana Jones whip at this point. And this is the part that over and over again uh, in in various writings, people are, who, who want to follow her, who want to hold her up as a kind of rock star, are trying to prove that she went to all these amazing places. Um, here's the rub, Jason. If you were wealthy back in the day that we're talking about, there was a thing called the Grand Tour. And again, this comes into why the upper classes needed to speak so many languages. The Grand Tour had all these big cities around the world, and since these were idle people with endless money, they would take these tours. But what's being explained here isn't much like a Grand Tour, but um, all these amazing people she's gonna gonna meet, and then they tie it into all this myth of you know I had these visions of this person and met him. But for my money, uh, I would fall on the side of all the people that are trying to point out that if you really did all these things, it wouldn't be that hard to prove it, and we can't prove it. So there's that. Before making her way to Asia, she first headed to Canada in the autumn of 1851. Saying to have been inspired by the novels of James Fenimore Cooper, she sought out the Native American communities of Quebec in the hopes of meeting their magico-religious specialists. She instead was said to have been robbed and later attributed these natives' behavior to the corrupting influence of Christian missionaries. She then headed south, visiting New Orleans, Texas, Mexico, and the Andes before transporting herself via ship from the West Indies to Ceylon and then Bombay. She spent two years in India, allegedly following the instructions found in letters that Moria had sent to her. She attempted to enter Tibet, but was prevented from doing so by the British administration. Yeah, so the one thing that strikes me about this is in so much of the writings, and I think it is The Secret Doctrine, I know I'm going to mix these books up because I had to force myself to reread through each of them. Uh, I had poked so many holes in both that I wasn't that into it as I was getting through them this time, but she takes a lot of time to bag on uh, Christianity in general, uh, all kinds of things, not, not much good she has to say. And then at the same time, she'll contrast ideas from Buddhism and Christianity, but she always comes back around and even at one point talks about the, the Masonic traditions, the Jesuit order who clearly are influencing one another or connected in some way, uh, but always coming back to the idea um, of all the damage that the Christian church in the West had done to the secret t tradition she was trying to cover. After this, she is said to have headed back to Europe, surviving a shipwreck near the Cape of Good Hope, before arriving in England in 1854, where she faced hostility as a Russian citizen due to the ongoing Crimean War between Britain and Russia. It was here that she makes claims to have worked as a concert musician for the Royal Philharmonic Society. From there, she sails to the United States, visiting New York City, where she met up with Albert Rawson again before touring Chicago, Salt Lake City, and San Francisco, and then sailing back to India via Japan. There, she spent time in Kashmir, Ladakh, and Burma before making a second attempt to enter Tibet. She claimed that this time she was successful and entered Tibet in 1856 through Kashmir, accompanied by a Tartar shaman who was attempting to reach Siberia and who thought that as a Russian citizen, Blavatsky would be able to aid him in doing so. According to this account, they reached Leh before becoming lost, eventually joining a traveling Tartar group before she headed back to India. She then returned to Europe via Madras and Java. All right, Jason. Well, we lost our internet conveniently for a while there. But anyhow, uh, this is a salient bullet point. You know, this is the Indiana Jones idea. There's a shipwreck, uh, all kinds of things going on. But, you know, you and I talked a bit offline. If one of us had, you know, five or six hours to waste, it would be interesting to break down how long these travel times are. I mean, she's going into Burma. She's going to India by way of Japan. She's supposedly headed into Tibet through Tibet again through Kashmir and Ladakh. Um, it goes on and on and on. And this is much of what I was reading about when people, you know, were trying to prove that, in fact, she had done any of this travel. Not sure where you're at with all this. 
I, I had the same thought last night, actually. I was like, well, if somebody had some free time on their hands, they could just go ahead and try and take a rough guess on all of these things she said to have done. Travel back then took time. A lot of time. 1854, man. Horseback is what I would guess. I mean, only major cities would have railways, I would assume. So there it is. Yeah, but I mean, when you're talking about coming in, going over to India by way of Japan, um, and then heading through Burma, Kashmir, Ladakh on your way to Tibet. I mean, come on. Uh, I, I've read accounts of some of the earliest people in T Tibet. As a matter of fact, there's a movie out, you know, with Brad Pitt about all the trouble they had getting into Tibet, and that's right around World War II. So none of this really rings true to me. But anyhow, back to you. After spending time in France and Germany, in 1858, she returned to her family, who at that time were living in Hiskov, Russia. Not sure how to pronounce these Russian words very well. My apologies there. She later claimed that there she began to exhibit further paranormal abilities, with rapping and creaking accompanying her around the house and furniture moving of its own volition. In 1860, she and her sister visited their maternal grandmother in Tiflis. In 1864, while riding in Ingrelia, Blavatsky fell from her horse and was in a coma for several months with a spinal fracture. Recovering in Tiflis, she claimed that upon awaking, she gained full control of her paranormal abilities. She then proceeded to Italy, Transylvania, and Serbia, possibly studying the Kabbalah with a rabbi at this point. In 1867, she proceeded to the Balkans, Hungary, and then Italy, where she spent time in Venice, Florence, and Mentana, claiming that in the latter she had been injured fighting for Giuseppe Garibaldi at the Battle of Mentana. I'll bet you she like threw an inflatable raft out of an airplane and wrote it down too. Um, is there anything this woman hasn't done? I mean, spinal fractures, comas, um, even injured in the battle uh, with Garibaldi. And this this goes on and on, Jason. But I'll let you keep pushing. She claimed to have then received a message from Moria to travel to Constantinople, where he met her, and together they traveled overland to Tibet, going through Turkey, Persia, Afghanistan, and then into India, entering Tibet via Kashmir. There, they allegedly stayed in the home of Moria's friend and colleague, Master Kut Humi, which was near to Tashilhunpo Monastery, Shigatsi. Sorry, Jason, that's actually Tashi Lumpo, and it's a well-known monastery, and it seems like there would be records of these things, but anyhow, go ahead. Well, that's very key, important point then. Yep. According to Blavatsky, both Moria and Kuthumi were Kashmiris of Punjabi origin, and it was at his home that Kuthumi taught students at the Galukpa, sect of Tibetan Buddhism. Kuthumi was described as having spent time in London and Leipzig, being fluent in both English and French, and like Moria, was a vegetarian. So these are the types of things where if they really occur, it shouldn't be that hard. Uh, Tashi Lampo is a big monastery, and I know uh, I'm drawing this from memory. I'm not sure if that's the, the seat of the Ponchan Lama. Maybe. I would have to look it up. But Tashi Lampo was a big deal, and these people kept records. And then they're mentioning, <coughs> excuse me, the Galukpa sect of Tibetan Buddhism. So people understand there were two big sects. One of them were the yellow hats called Galupka, and this is the sect that the Dalai Lama is from. And again, the, the claims are made by this woman in the book, I think it's The Secret Doctrine, that all these things she's laying down and all these secrets she's revealing are available in any reputable Galupa monastery. Problem is, is people went to try to confirm this and they could not do it. Uh, all these problems with the stories that are being put down, but I mean, if you just take the track she's claiming to have taken right here, I mean, come on. Uh, Constant Constantinople, through Turkey, through Persia, through Afghanistan, then into, into India, and for the third time entering Tibet via Kashmir. Um, I don't know, man. Anyhow, Jason. <laughs> She claimed that in Tibet, she was taught an ancient and unknown language called Senzar. She also claimed to translate a number of ancient texts written in this unique language that were preserved by the monks of a monastery. She stated that she was not permitted to go into the monastery itself. She also claimed that while in Tibet, Moria and Kuthumi helped her develop and control her psychic powers. Among the abilities that she referenced in regards to these masters were clairvoyance, clairaudience, telepathy, the ability to control another's consciousness, to dematerialize and rematerialize physical objects, and to project their astral bodies, thus giving the appearance of being in two places at once. She claimed to have remained at the spiritual retreat from late 1868 until late 1870. 
Blavatsky never claimed in print to have visited Lhasa, although this is a claim that would be made for her and other later sources, including the account provided by her sister. So I've read a lot of accounts about a lot of lamas and about a lot of Buddhist lineages and everything that I've read, people take lifetimes uh, to master higher abilities with their mind, things like clairvoyance. And here she is for two years, 68, <laughs> 69, and 1870, and she's rematerializing, dematerializing, doing, I mean, come on, man. Um, the ring of truth is in none of this, Jason. And again, that sets aside the fact that nobody has ever been able to prove she went to any of these places. Anyhow, man. Some more travels go on, and after <laughs> leaving Greece and arriving in Cairo in 1871, she made a first attempt at investigating and explaining the nature of spiritual phenomena. For that purpose, she formed the Societe Spiritae, or Spiritist Society, for the investigation of the spiritism of the French occultist Allan Kardec. It would appear that this was done against the advice of Palos Metamon, a well-known Coptic mystic and occultist with whom she was in touch at the time. Her sister, Vera de Velahovsky, was in correspondence with her during these years and wrote that she chose to start in this way. Since there was no other philosophy available to give people a chance to see for themselves how mistaken they were, she would first give room to an already established and accepted teaching, and then, when the public would see that nothing was coming out of it, she would then offer her own explanations. However, the Societe Spirite failed within a fortnight, as Blavatsky could not find honest and qualified mediums to do the kind of research she had envisioned. The bottom line on that was, there was fraud. It doesn't surprise me, Jason. Um, at some point, we, you know, if I would have had six hours to burn, I would have mapped out all the places she claimed to have been. Um, but, it, it, you know, in, in this case, they flat out cite fraud. Um, it, it's astonishing to me that it's not cited flat out in a lot of places. The problem is, is with a lot of these writings, many people are trying to hold up Blavatsky as some kind of a rock star. Um, but anyhow, let's keep pushing. Her ties with spiritualism, as discussed earlier, really start to take shape with her arrival in New York in July 1873. She is said to have first worked as a dressmaker to earn a living. After her acquaintance with Colonel Henry Steele Olcott at Chittenden, Vermont, in the house of the Eddy brothers, she took up journalism, writing mostly on spiritualism for magazines and translating Colonel Olcott's articles into Russian. For over 15 years have I fought my battle for the blessed truth, she wrote in The Spiritualist Scientist, published in Boston on December 3, 1874. For the sake of spiritualism, I have left my house, an easy life amongst a civilized society, and have become a wanderer upon the face of this earth. Well, that's an understatement. There's very few places on the face of the earth this lady has not been by the accounts that are put forward here. But, you know, another thing, Jason, I would point out is she claims to have had a shipwreck at the Cape of Good Hope. These things probably, if they occurred, would be you, you could look them up in some way, shape or form. But here, here's another trail uh, where people could try to determine on some level if she even existed as, as an actual human being um, because she's claiming to have published in all these places. I simply didn't have time for it. When I read through the books, I I got to the point where I had pretty much made up my mind that what I was reading was nonsensical and couldn't hold water. Um, but there is a trail here for anyone who wanted to go look to see if they could prove she actually existed in some way, shape or form. I would be surprised if she didn't. I would be surprised if there was no person that ever existed. Um, I just think most of the things attributed to this person uh, d don't don't hold water. That's the way I see it. The starting point of her career that made her a well-known figure was the foundation of the Theosophical Society in 1875. This society professed to expound the esoteric tradition of Buddhism and aimed at forming a universal brotherhood of man, studying and making known the ancient religions, philosophies, and sciences, investigating the laws of nature, and developing the divine powers latent in man. It was claimed to be directed by secret Mahatmas, or Masters of Wisdom. I guess she met these masters on her world travels everywhere, but I will state for the record, um, in many of the accounts where she is referencing Buddhist tenets and ideas, uh, I found trouble. And I have read endlessly on Eastern traditions that have to do with meditation and Tibetan Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, and to some degree, Thera Theravadan Buddhism. And uh, what I found is most of the things she's writing about don't really jive in the way that I understand them, having studied it for years. In summer 1875, Blavatsky began working on a book, Isis Unveiled, outlining her theosophical worldview, much of which would be written while staying in the Ithaca home of 
Haram Corson, a professor of English literature at Cornell University. Although she had hoped to call it The Veil of Isis, it would be published as Isis Unveiled. While writing it, Blavatsky claimed to be aware of a second consciousness within her body, referring to it as the lodger who is in me, and stating that it was this second consciousness that inspired much of the writing. In Isis Unveiled, Blavatsky quoted extensively from other esoteric and religious texts, although her contemporary and colleague Olcott always maintained that she had quoted from books that she did not have access to. So even in this account, you know, what she's writing is being attributed not to her, but to this other consciousness that's living in her. In other words, I didn't write this stuff. Um, but the one thing that strikes me here is I read Isis Unveiled. I read it a while ago, and then I burned through it again for this episode. And I can tell you this. I don't feel like Isis was ever unveiled anywhere during the course of that book. Um, and I found a lot of conflicting ideas uh, with regards to Buddhism and Christianity, um, both of which I'm very familiar with. I've read so many versions of the Bible so many times, and I have a number of years of studying meditative traditions that cover Buddhism thoroughly. Um, I found problems in all of it. Anyhow, back to you. So for the next few years, the Theosophical Society established links with an Indian Hindu reform movement, the Arya Samaj, which had been founded by the Swami Dayananda Sarwati. Blavatsky and Olcott believed that the two organizations shared a common spiritual worldview. Unhappy with life in the United States, Blavatsky decided to move to India, with Olcott agreeing to join her, securing work as a U.S. trade representative to the country. In December, the duo auctioned off many of their possessions, although Edison gifted them a phonograph to take with them to India. How interesting. They left <laughs> New York City aboard the Canada, which took them to London. After meeting with well wishes in the capital, they traveled to Liverpool, there setting sail aboard the Speak Hall, arriving in Bombay in February 1879. In the city, they were greeted with celebrations organized by Arya Samaj member Harishund Chintaman before obtaining a house in Girgaum Road, part of Bombay's native area. So, I mean, if these things are happening, it seems like there should be a trail that's not too difficult to unravel here to prove. But again, I mean, is there any place they didn't go? Is there any famous personage they didn't meet? Edison himself is giving them a phonograph, which probably weighs, what, 40 pounds back in the day that they're going <laughs> to pack off to India with them. Anyhow, Jason, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it be. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, so due to health issues, Blavatsky leaves India in March of 1885. By this time, the Theosophical Society had experienced rapid growth, with 121 lodges having been chartered across the world, 106 of which were located in India, in India, Burma, and Ceylon. I wonder how much truth there is to any of this. Um, there must be a there there for these to have been printed or people would have flat out said it was wrong. But when you think of a place like Burma, you're looking at uh, almost 100 percent Buddhist. Um, so I wonder where these kind of spiritual traditions would have a place to fit in. Uh, hard to know, Jason. Hard to know. Anyhow. Settling in Naples, Italy in April 1885, she began living off of a small society pension and continued working on her next book, The Secret Doctrine. She then moved to Wurzburg in the Kingdom of Bavaria, where she was visited by a Swedish theosophist, the Countess Constance Wachtmeister, who became her constant companion throughout the rest of her life. In December 1885, the SPR published their report on Blavatsky and her alleged phenomena, authored by Richard Hodgson. In his report... Hodgson accused Blavatsky of being a spy for the Russian government, further accusing her of faking paranormal phenomena. The report caused much tension within the society with a number of Blavatsky's followers denouncing her and resigning from the organization on the basis of the fraud. So here it comes. Um, there's there's logical problems here as well, Jason, beside the fact that she's being called a Russian spy and all these other things and a charlatan, which is almost certainly true if she existed as a person. Why is she now living off a small society pension? She's basically from an upper crust elite family, married to a general, clearly was a woman of means, having traveled around the world God knows how many times at this point. But now all of a sudden we're being told she's living on a small society pension. Just the logical problem. Problems all over the place. Blavatsky wanted to sue her accusers, although Olcott advised against it, believing that the surrounding publicity would damage the society. In private letters, Blavatsky expressed relief that the criticism was focused on her and that the identity of the masters had not been publicly exposed. For decades after, theosophists criticized Hodgson's methodology, arguing that he set out to disprove and attack Blavatsky rather than conduct an unbiased analysis of her claims and abilities. In 1986, the SPR admitted this to be the case and retracted the findings of the report. 
All right. Well, here's another thing, Jason. Um, you know, she's acting like masters are, her, are directing her. Um, and all the research I have done in my life around people who are studying to have a higher mind, be initiated into places where teachers can teach them how to meditate and go towards what a human, a higher human being can be. You are faced every time with the idea of initiation, where the student has to prove himself worthy to be prepared to accept what's apparently going to be important information, not suitable for every, everyone. In the Bible, it may be uh, phrased as don't cast your pearls before the swine, this kind of an idea. It holds true, it rings true, it is logically, you can work it out logically that there are certain things of a high nature in this world that wouldn't just be offered to any old person who didn't you know, meet up to the standards that were required. Not only that, once they're initiated, in almost every account that I've ever read, it takes many years years, half a lifetime, a lifetime even, to begin to master any of these things of import that help human beings reach a higher level of being human. And here, once again, it's like, oh, there's these masters directing me, and I'm just writing this crap down in books and throwing it out to anyone who will pick it up. Just none of it, none of it, Jason. Anyhow. Hey, getting your black belt in karate takes longer than some of the things she did. Exactly. I mean, good point. Exactly. <laughs> you might have to work harder getting a driver's license than it did for the what one and a half years it took well let's let's keep pushing we need, we need to get to crowley because i'm about done with blavatsky right in 1886 by which time she was largely wheelchair bound blavatsky moved to ostend in belgium where she was visited by theosophists from across europe supplementing her pension she established a small ink producing business she received messages from members of the society's london lodge who were dissatisfied with the current person running it a man named Sinnet. And they believed that he was focusing on attaining upper-class support rather than encouraging the promotion of theosophy throughout society, a criticism Blavatsky agreed with. In May of 1887, she moves to London. There, she established the Blavatsky Lodge as a rival to that run by Sinnet, draining much of its membership. Yeah, and there's no place this lady hasn't moved to and lived, and uh, she's wheelchair-bound at this point, apparently, as she's jumping from big city to big city back in the 1800s. And again, we're faced with the whole she's trying to supplement this meager pension she has. There's no mention at any point uh, that I found of a falling out with her very rich uh, parentage and general of a husband. So who knows, Jason? In 1888, Blavatsky established the esoteric section of the Theosophical Society, a group under her complete control for which admittance was restricted to those who had passed certain tests. She identified it as a place for true theosophists who would focus on the system's philosophy rather than experiment with producing paranormal phenomena. So it seems like she set up initiations that she didn't have to go through herself with other older traditions. There it is, man. I went to Tibet. I was there for a year and a half. I learned how to dematerialize, rematerialize. But uh, I'm going to test all you people. Um, do as I do, not as you know. Do as I say, not as I do. I guess. Uh, <laughs> nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. Still in London, Blavatsky founded a magazine, controversially calling it Lucifer. In this theosophical publication, she sought to completely ignore claims regarding paranormal phenomena and focus instead on a discussion of philosophical ideas. Blavatsky also finished writing The Secret Doctrine. Since a commercial publisher willing to publish the approximately 1,500-page tome could not be found, she instead established the Theosophical Publishing Company, who brought out the work in two volumes, the first published in October 1888 and the second in January 1889. Continuing into 1889, her books The Voice of the Silence and The Key to Theosophy are also published. So here's the woman on her meager pension trying to figure out ways to supplement that pension, and she is now launching her own publishing company because no one will touch her 1,500-page tome. And I will say again, both of the versions of the Blavatsky books I read are abridged, and they go into pretty good detail about why they're abridging it. Much of it has to do with the nonsensical nature of what was removed, and part of it has to do with uh, things they can't make jive anywhere. But again, I mean, what are we talking about here? Is the lady on a meager pension or is it something else? She's launching her own publishing company now. Um, logical, logical problems all the way down the road here. And to finish her up, as many times in her past, she continued to face accusations of fraud regarding her spiritual dealings. The U.S. newspaper The Sun published a July 1890 article based on information provided by an ex-member of the society named Elliot Coos. Lavatsky sued the newspaper for libel and they publicly retracted their accusations in September 1892. 
That winter, Britain had been afflicted by an influenza epidemic, which Blavatsky contracted. This led to her death on the 8th of May in 1891. The date would come to be commemorated by theosophists ever since as White Lotus Day. So, Jason, I would suggest that if such a person as Helena Blavatsky ever existed, the interesting story would be on her world travels, would it not? Uh, it would certainly trump anything that I read in Isis Unveiled, where Isis wasn't unveiled at all, and the secret doctrines, all of which seem to be to me, and we'll get into this a bit with Crowley, but not to the same degree, nowhere near the same degree, that she simply went around borrowing from spiritual traditions which she could read about. As an example, uh, you and I covered uh, the idea of masonry and the Jesuits and the connections there and how they were booted out of so many countries. In one of the books by Blavatsky, either Isis Unveiled or The Secret Doctrine, I forget which now, um, she actually states verbatim the dates, the countries, and everything, even the connection between the Jesuits and Freemasonry, again, showing that it was basically the regurgitation of public, publicly available or known historical items, whereas so many of the other ideas that had to do with specific sects of Buddhism, supposed documents that could be found in any self-respecting monastery that could not be be found. All these other things had problems for me. Um, let's call it, Jason. Is Helena Blavatsky live or is she Memorex? Oh, she seems to be a fabrication, probably based off of a real person, but so much embellishment to the point that it's mere fantasy. That's that's what I would say. Um, I never want to go so far as to say this person never existed, although I wouldn't be surprised to learn that was true in this case. If there was, in fact, a person named Blavatsky, uh, all these things that are attributed to her are nonsensical. They don't hold water. And anyone who chooses not to just accept what they're reading but go in and will challenge will find that there's been a hell of a lot written demonstrating that it's not even feasible, uh, most of this stuff, uh, and also that she probably never traveled to any of the places she's attributed to having traveled, uh, at least in the Far East anyhow. Anyhow, Jason, that brings us close to the top of the first hour. Is there anything you want to cover here? There's the, also the other side of the coin here where she could have been a perfectly real person who did do certain things involving all these societies and everything, but she was a total snake oil salesman, which is why she had to keep moving around, and she was just looking to make money off the whole thing. That wouldn't surprise me, but you know, there's a paradox here, you know, comes from a wealthy elite family, marries a general, apparently has enough money to to just go around the world any old time she feels like it. And she goes around the world, man. She goes basically everywhere. Um, where did all that money come from? So I, I don't know, but yeah, I, I would agree with you. Snake oil salesman seems to be much closer logical explanation of the Blavatsky story for me anyhow. Well, since we have a few minutes left, let's get into Indiana Jones number two for today's show, Aleister Crawley. Not just the subject of an infamous Ozzy Osbourne song, this guy also did it all in regards to the occult. Uh, there's there's no getting away from it. As people can see by the thumbnail I made from this episode, um, Crowley is attached to so many famous personages. And of course, the number of entertainers that re-echo the ideas of Crowley is astonishing. And it's not just any old entertainers. We're talking Beatles caliber. We're talking Jimmy Page caliber. We're talking Ozzy Osbourne caliber. These are names that when they say things, they go out into the world and they hit millions of minds. But but back to you, Jason. Alistair Crowley was born as Edward Alexander Crowley in Warwickshire, England in 1875 to fundamentalist Christian parents following the Plymouth Brethren sect. At 18, and for the next few years, quite a few years actually, he starts climbing numerous mountains. He adopts the name Alistair while studying first moral science and then English literature at Trinity College, Cambridge in 1895. One thing about Crowley is they're going to attribute quite a bit of education, but as we get in here, the one thing that always struck me, and I, just to be perfectly clear, the tome attributed to, to Crowley, uh, 777 Kabbalistic writings, I have never been able to get all the way through it. It is so damn drier than a piece of toast and nonsensical, most of it, uh, that it's nearly impossible. But when you get into these books, at least two or three of the prefaces claim that almost all the major book writing he did was completed by the time he was in his young 30s. So we'll address that in a minute. 
Now, again, just like with Blavatsky, he did so much stuff that it seems almost insane that he could have crammed it all in. Now, granted, he was a little later and travel was a little easier, but still, it seems like he just did too much for the time period he was alive and, and in the amount of time that the claims are being made. And of course, I had to skip a whole lot, and I mean a whole lot regarding this guy. So we're going to get to the salient points in his life and the, and the things that supposedly got him on this path to being the wickedest man in the world and all that kind of thing, head occultist. It, again, it just seems a lot like fantasy. Larger than life, uh, much larger than life. And when you connect it to entertainment, in my view, you're going down a road that we have gone down so many times here. But Jason, let's begin to wrap this up. But let's say say something about the net neutrality vote, which is happening, I think, I don't know, it's today or tomorrow or something like that. Almost certainly uh, the net neutrality changes that are going to come uh, are going to play directly into the censorship that is going on everywhere online. Do not be fooled. Uh, you may think you understand what is going on. You may read what the, the apparent changes could be or might not be. And to be frank on the face of it, it looks like they're about to hand ISPs a hell of a lot more power than they deserve. But to get back to the point, there is a full frontal press all over this world for censorship online. And if you think that what's going on with the net neutrality laws is independent of that, maybe you should think again. Anything you want to add, Jason? This is their excuse to lock down on everything. Don't let yourself fall into the nonsense that the mainstream media is going to put out there. If they pull off what they want to pull off, it means that ISPs can just put up blocks that you can't get through to go to certain places. Not only that, you know, if you're a person like, take myself, um, I have streaming content on a website. Uh, these are the kinds of things that the cost to run these things may be affected. There's no reason for it. Most of the ISPs are multi-billion dollar businesses in the first place. And as a matter of fact, a lot of them have their own content you know, that they're trying to push. So if they start to get the power about what gets returned in search returns, what do you think might happen there? I think they might be self-serving a little bit. But anyhow, Jason, that does bring us to the top of the first hour for episode 86. We're gonna come back with Crowley. We're gonna do an in-depth look at Crowley. Um, it was hard for me to take a lot of the Blavatsky stuff very seriously because it became so nonsensical so quickly and having just read two of her books i really just wanted to be able to say i don't buy any of it let's move on but crowley is a bit more interesting and not only that he's tied into pop culture in many many ways up into the modern era so with that said that's the first hour of episode 86 crow triple seven radio podcast i hope to see you all over at crow triple seven radio.com for the full show and again transcripts are available for members over there now so there it is cheers <laughs> <laughs> 